Time for Windows Weekly, episode 158. Paul's on vacation in Portugal celebrating his anniversary, but Mary Jo Foley and Ed Bott are here from ZDNet. We're going to talk about uh, Google's announcements and how Microsoft responds and a big shakeup in the Microsoft Entertainment Division. It's all coming up with Windows Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Mary Jo Foley and Ed Bott, episode 158, recorded May 27th, 2010. Bringing sexy back to enterprise. Windows Weekly is brought to you by. Go to Assist Express. If you're in tech support, clients rely on you for fast and reliable service. Help them the fast and easy way with Go to Assist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by Drobo, the original S Pro, Drobo FS, and new Drobo Elite, offering expandable storage products for individuals, small businesses, and creative teams. For more information and instant rebates, visit drobo.com slash windows. And by the new Carbonite Pro. It's simple, secure, and affordable online backup for your small business. For a free trial and to learn more, visit carbonitepro.com. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers all the workings of Redmond and the great companies up there, mostly Microsoft, joining us right now. Actually, I should say, Paul Therat is in Portugal, and uh, we're giving him a much-needed rest. It's kind of the coffee cure. But fortunately, we have an excellent crew here to, uh, to take his place. It took two to do it. Starting with Mary Jo Foley, editor of the All About Microsoft blog, author of Microsoft 2.0 from Wiley & Sons. She's upside down today. I am. Literally. Sorry. <laughs> there is a driver problem with her asus laptop you know the first thing i asked because dane said um mary joe's upside down and, and i said well can she turn her camera right side up and i guess you could flip your laptop over but let's just leave it the way it is i think it's kind of funny i should make your lower third upside down though to, to really make it work hi mary <laughs> joe thanks for joining us Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the chat room is amazed at how your bangs stay put even though you're, yes. you're upside down. Yeah. It's hairspray. The miracle of hairspray. <laughs> also, You'll you need them as a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's Ed Bod's voice. I recognize Ed. Ed is an old friend who continues to write for uh, ZDNet, as does uh, Mary Jo. Good to see you again. It's good to see you, Leo. And you've written many a book. Uh, former editor of, uh, don't tell me, don't tell me, PC Computing, right? That's the one. I knew it. The late lamented PC computing. He writes Ed Mott's Microsoft report on cdnet.com. And it's great to have you both uh, here today. Filling awesome in for, to be here. For Paul, thank you for doing it. Um, I have to almost have to start with uh, Mary Jo's uh, scooplet uh, from uh, like today or yesterday that perhaps Steve Ballmer will be at the Apple, Win Win Apple Developers Conference. Well, wait, wait, before you. Give me any credit or discredit for that. <laughs> that wasn't my story. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because I find that it a little far-fetched. What was the premise? That's, why, why in heaven's name? The last time uh, Bill Gates showed up was when Steve Jobs had just come back to, to uh, Apple in 97, I think, and pledged $150 million in continued uh, support of Microsoft Office for Apple. Fast forward right. 13 years. 14 well, well, the premise is that based on one Wall Street analyst's view or rumors or tips or whatever, um, Steve Ballmer is going to be on stage with Steve Jobs for 7.5 minutes or something like that. And he's going to say something about developing for the iPhone and the iPad, supposedly. Hmm. That's the premise, the very shaky hmm. premise that this whole thing is built on. Any word from Microsoft on this? No. They haven't stopped laughing. I don't. <laughs> their, 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 hands are, their hands are shaking until they stop laughing and can actually compose a reply. It's I, awfully far-fetched. It, it seems a little far-fetched, yeah. I mean, I, 
Okay, I'm going to beg to differ. I don't think it's far fetched. Well, but, but Apple won't let it uh, uh, flash on the iPhone. Why would they let silver light on the iPhone? Well, okay, think about this. If you hate Adobe and you hate Google, who's the other partner to bring in as your ally? Microsoft. Interesting. It's kind of an axis. Right. So maybe, or maybe Silverlight is just the development environment going forward for iPhone, iPad. Like, give them another option. Get the antitrust officials off of Apple's back. Because you can say, hey, look, we're open. We're so open. We're even working with the evil empire. Yeah, that would be interesting. So um, Microsoft has tweeted or tweeted on this matter. This is the Microsoft tweet. Steve Ballmer not speaking at AppDev Conference, nor appearing on Dancing with the Stars, <laughs> nor riding in the Belmont. Just FYI. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat that as conclusive uh, denial. This is, not, this is not a nine denial denial. This is not a no comment. This is like... Are you nuts? <laughs> that was, a, you know, that was, so I, I thought, so this was originally a bank shot. Uh, this was, I think, a, a blogger at Barron's quoting yes. an analyst, and he specifically said that it was an analyst from a small firm, you know, just kind of code, uh, and I think it was code just for, a Hail Mary of this guy's part. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to be yeah, a big you firm. Know, so it's just a, uh, but no, the, look, uh, an Apple keynote is a highly scripted thing where the tone is uh, is measured and the pace is uh, it builds in such a perfect way that in fact at 42 minutes after the hour that's right. when they unveil the product. We know that because the iPhones are all set to 942. That's absolutely dead serious. And so the, and Steve Ballmer is not someone who can control his energy level yeah. uh, to the to the amount required for uh, an Apple keynote. <laughs> you know, that, that's You're saying just, he can't that, sit backstage with a bottle of water. He's going <laughs> to come running out. <laughs> He'll come bursting out there. No, that's a uh, uh, you know, I think this one this one got more than its uh, fifteen minutes. <laughs> All right, we're done. I just I couldn't resist. It was just such a funny story, and I just... absolutely. That's... There is a more serious uh, story here, which is Microsoft is sitting kind of a little bit waiting on the wings here, while Apple has its big conference, announces the iPhone. Uh, Google had its Google I/O last week. You know, I, Microsoft had a bunch of conferences. They had Mix, and they had. Uh, um, uh, PDC, PDC. Last fall. so they've been they've been in the news, but but now they're sitting back. Windows Phone does, Seven doesn't come out till the fall. Google's talking about Android. Apple will be talking about its iPhone. Uh, in fact, one uh, Apple blogger, uh, John Gruber, in his uh, Daring Fireball blog, said it's 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 an Apple and Google world now, and Microsoft is just an also ran. Do you think that uh, you guys are f closely follow Microsoft? Do you think there's any any feeling that of that in in Redmond? Um, well, on the phone side, I'd say they're they're fairly worried. I mean, they're excited about what they've got with Windows Phone 7, but they know they're the complete and total underdog. And yeah. they have a ton of catching up to do. And they're also going in with a platform that is brand new, has no apps for it yet, because Windows Phone, uh, sorry, Windows Mobile 6 apps don't work on Windows Phone 7. So Ooh, that's I tough. think they, that's they're tough. worried, I'd say. Because it's an app world now, isn't it? You know, if you, don't, you know, everybody wants to know how many apps you have. Right. Does that yeah, matter? Yeah, my, you know, well, Apple did a pretty good job of, of defining that as the, as the playing field. But, you know, what I thought was interesting about Gruber's post, it was, it was typically well-argued and well-written. But, uh, you, know, you know, Android didn't exist 18 months ago. Mm -hmm. And yet now... Parody, they're like, parody they're at, at least. parody with Apple. So that's how quickly things can change right. here. Um, uh, smartphones are disposable products. Uh, the technology changes in them in a, in a year or two. Um, you know, Apple has, uh, has set those rules, basically. So, so yes, Microsoft has a tremendous amount of catching up to do, um, but they can, you know, they can get up and, and be on the track uh, very quickly in the fall. And so, you know, a year from now, we could be saying, wow, it's a three-horse race all of a sudden. Uh, or we could be saying, wow, look, you know, nobody's buying Androids anymore because they're so, because the uh, phone companies don't want to support them 
and they're not getting a subsidy for them. You know, so, who knows? Microsoft's no stranger to this the, in the consumer space because the game, it reminds me of the game consoles where uh, Sony was on top, then Microsoft was on top, and then the Dark Horse Nintendo comes along, and it's a really three-horse race, and it's a tough one. Yeah. And that's, the, that's just the consumer space, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Well, you've been in the... Uh, in, in the context of mobile devices and phones, um, you're talking about things that only a handful of of uh, technical buyers are buying on the you know on the basis of specs and such. Most the, you know the, the the large untapped markets that are out there for these things are buying them on the basis of of uh, you know price and contract and who their carrier is. I mean, in the United States, uh, Apple has less than 10 percent share. Largely because they're with AT and T, right? A much hated carrier. A much a much hated company. I've got you know here's here's a here's an iPhone and a and a Windows Mobile phone here, um, an old school Windows Mobile phone uh, side by side. The uh, in my office right here, this iPhone will not get a signal at all. Uh, I can get typically one or one and a half bars on this on this HTC phone. So you've got issues with the hardware. You've got issues with it's the, the same carrier. It's AT and T, wow. which doesn't have three wow. G service where I live. Even you know, so I mean, a lot of people make have to make their decisions about mobile devices on the basis of of external factors. It was also, I mean, in business where the where Windows Mobile is still very strong, along with BlackBerry RIM. Um, it's also about support for exchange and security, right? Now, now Android made some announcements uh, last week, and I'm not sh I don't know if we cover the enterprise space, so uh, maybe you guys understand better. Were they sufficient? I know, I know the enterprise doesn't really embrace the iPhone particularly. Well, I think I think one thing to bring up here is we also don't know how Windows Phone 7 is going to embrace the enterprise either. I mean, like we you're don't saying, know? Leo, we don't know because in the past, Windows Mobile, that other platform that they're not going to support really anymore, was a big enterprise play. But Windows Phone 7 is definitely designed for the consumer first and foremost. Mm. Um, and they made a conscious choice to do that because they said we weren't focused at all on the consumer and now we're going to do the opposite. We're really going to focus on the consumer. So, you know, they're definitely going to have, I'm sure, um, exchange connectivity and mobile office support and all that. But we don't really know what they're going to do in terms of allowing enterprise apps uh, to run on those phones or how they're going to get those apps on the phones. They haven't talked about whether they'll allow uh, business customers to privately download um, or have to go through the app store, the Microsoft app store, which is going to be a nightmare. No one will do that. So there's a ton of unanswered questions, even for Microsoft on the enterprise with the new platform. Why is Microsoft turning its back on enterprise where it's been so strong in the phone? Well, I don't think they necessarily are. Yeah. Um, I, you know, there, the, uh, there is the issues that enterprises care about in terms of mobile devices are uh, encryption and uh, remote wipe. Um, they don't care about apps. They want uh, phone calls and email to be able to get through and for people to be able to look at, you know, look at documents and such. But, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the idea that you need, uh, you know, a robust app store like the, the iTunes app store, which has six pages of, of apps devoted to making fart sounds. You know, doesn't see <laughs> I'm glad you counted, Ed. <laughs> I, I checked. You know, that's, that's like almost 300 separate apps there. Uh, specific to that. You know, when they say 200,000, I don't know if they're really paying attention to that particular uh, stat. That's funny. <laughs> Well, you know, maybe they should be. And I think that's, you know, the enterprises are really paying attention more to, uh, their, you know, it, it, I'll tell you, encryption is the thing that matters more than anything else. You, you bet. Lose Certificates and all of that stuff. Well, yeah. right. But you lose a phone. Now, it, you know, it used to be you lost a laptop. Oh, I see what you're saying. Not merely email certificates, but, but encryption for the phone itself, for the data. For the data. Yeah, because, because these are little computers now, and they yeah. can have confidential data on them that is, you know, sh uh, uh, that shockingly damaging to, to a corporation and, and can expose it to great liability. So the things, you know, I, I would say apps are down, you know, in the bottom half of the list to be charitable and, uh, and, and the ability to, and to uh, securely encrypt the contents of the device and to quickly uh, remotely wipe the device. Now, we know Apple can do that, yeah. at least with the new, 
at least with the new uh, iPhone yeah. 4G. Um, no, they, they've always been able to do that. That's a uh, nice right. feature. Microsoft can do that too, though, but only on Windows Mobile. We don't know if they can do it, although we're assuming they're going to do it on Windows Phone. 7. Oh, and, and Ed, you were making a joke about the 4G. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> about the stolen 4G, which miraculously I lost know. all sometimes its contents. I'm, sometimes I'm kind of subtle. Yes. Uh, yeah. these things. <laughs> but, but really, apps... Apps are kind of a um, uh, a very minor story for enterprise uh, for enterprise adoption. So that's why. Wow, that's interesting. So even if you're making a consumer phone with Windows Phone, you don't need apps. That's not the. That's not uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of the things that people are going to want to do from an enterprise point of view are going to involve you know making a VPN connection to a, a host somewhere right. and yeah. and doing something in a in a web browser. So as long as you've got a secure web browser, a secure network connection and um you know in a in a device that you can count on to be compliant with whatever standards your industry requires you to be compliant with things like HIPAA and uh, Sarbanes Oxley and such then you know then you'll then you'll uh, you'll have an entree into uh into the enterprise and that's also where Microsoft's strategy of partnering with hardware makers comes in so it might be that you know hard phone maker x is going to really uh, focus on the needs of of uh, a certain class of consumers whereas you know y and z are going to make you know ruggedized secure enterprise class phones how's the kin doing the kin's clearly a microsoft's consumer phone with kind I of haven't, yeah, i, I haven't followed phones. it at all yeah yeah, yeah. I, I followed it a little bit um it, well, it got widely, widely panned by the press when it came out. But, you know, Microsoft argued, and I think somewhat correctly so, that they, we're not the audience for it that It ain't phone. the press. It's the kids. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And I've seen a few people give it to their kids and have their kids review it and look at it and, you know, have it around for a couple weeks. And the kids seem to like it. Teenagers, you know. But back to the issue of cost, it's, it's prohibitively expensive as far as the uh, data plan goes. Yeah, that's what Paul's been... Uh, really unhappy about that all right yeah. we're going to take a break when we come back i uh, uh we're going to find out who said this in his farewell missive to his co-workers quote in response to the curiosity no chairs were thrown no ultimatums served i am not moving to cupertino or mountain view i did not take a courier job that's a clue by the way and i require no assistance finding the door We'll talk about the. <laughs> I love that. I just love that. <laughs> we'll talk about who that was and why he's leaving Microsoft in just a little bit. Mary Jo Foley uh, is our guest, uh, a longtime Microsoft observer at ZDNet. It's so great to have uh, you back uh, again with us, even yes. if you are upside down. And for those just yes, tuning our you. video in, it's a Windows issue. We don't know. Just a driver. You know, <laughs> I had to get that in. A little bit. <laughs> Ed Bot is also here. He is a great Windows expert, award-winning author, and the author of Ed Bot's Microsoft Report at ZDNet.com. A couple of my, a couple of my old ZD colleagues. Yes. Today. <laughs> there's, Indeed. There's a. Um, uh, I was just looking at Ning, and there's a ZD as if Davis refugees group on Ning. If you, <laughs> either of you ever want to join, I guess. Do you even work? You don't really work for Z, who owns ZDNet? I don't even know anymore. CBS. C CBS. CBS. Inter CBS Interactive. So CNET bought it. CBS bought CNET. You now owned by CBS. Yes. That's Perfect. that's not bad. That's good. I I actually have a post on my blog, on my personal blog. You know, ZD is not ZDNet, and vice versa. That explains. <laughs> How that uh, hmm. how that happens? Because you get asked that a lot. I yeah. get asked it uh, not so much. I, I actually I don't get asked that a lot. People just, just assume uh, it. They don't ask. Yeah. Assume it, yeah. and so they say, "Oh, uh, you know, one of my favorite Ziff Davis guys." No, 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 uh, we're not Ziff Davis. But we're, you were. Yeah. We were. <laughs> <laughs> the initials are there. I know because I was at ZDTV, and, well, and and it is a tribute to uh, what Bill Ziff built. Uh, there that all the people associated with want to maintain that's right that brand equity despite the changes in corporate that's, that's ownership right. the you know that's a good point usually when you sell a company you change the name you know cbs interactive or whatever but no you're still zeding that because that's got the that's got the cachet anyway we're, we're going to continue in just a second i do want to talk to uh, you about my friends at uh, uh citrix who do of course go to meeting go to my pc i know you're very familiar with them citrix is also the big name in enterprise 
a desktop sharing. They've got a, a, a remote desktop product that's specifically for the IT and support professional. If you support software or you support a, a group of users or maybe just mom, dad, cousin Al, this is the product for you. I've been using this for years. The new Go to Assist Express is faster, better, easier to use with a lot of features designed specifically for the support professional. For instance, you know, you don't have to have any software installed on the person you're supporting's machine. You just you just say, you can do this over the phone with them. You know, you get tired of going, click start. Go to programs. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I, I should have done this with you, Mary Jo. When we were flipping you upside down, we could have done yes. this. Yes, we I, should have tried I that. I just <laughs> said, go to, go to assist.com. Here's the ID. Boom, you're, I'm in there. It takes 30 seconds for you to download just a little stub of software, and I'm in there, and I'm and it's Mac or PC, by the way. You can support Macs from PCs and vice versa, PC to PC, Mac to Mac. This is it's just fantastic stuff. You have eight sessions at once if you want, and there, well, there's a good reason for that, not because you're a glutton for punishment, be, because uh, you know you start an install on one, a scan on another, you're fixing another. You, you can move on. You don't have to wait around. You can find out what software is running, exactly what version of Windows, exactly what security software, what's going on in the background. You can drag and drop fixes from your computer to the remote computer. I mean, just goes on and on. Really great stuff. Try it free for 30 days right now. Go to assist.com slash windows. G-O-T-O assist.com slash windows. You try it free for 30 days. They have day passes if you do this occasionally, but if you're a pro, you're going to want to have this in your toolkit all the time. Just the best. Go to assist.com slash windows. So the person who wrote that email, of course, Jay Allard, who is leaving Microsoft. And I think the circumstances are kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Mary Jo, you wrote a little bit about this. Yes, they're very interesting. Um, so Jay Allard, last we heard, was spearheading the Courier project for Microsoft, which was See, that. Now, I thought Gizmodo made it up. No, it was real. <laughs> it, it was, was real. So my, I was. I thought Gizmodo had this, you know, concept <laughs> video, and they kind of hyped it as if it was really going to happen. And then it got can't. Oh, it, Microsoft says we're not doing it like like they ever were doing it. So it was in the labs. How far along had it gotten? Well, that's what we don't know. Um, we don't know how far along it was. You know, and it was definitely a Skunk Works project. I don't think it ever looked like those concept videos, probably. But supposedly right. Jay Allard was the guy spearheading it and you know he did something similar with the xbox and the zune he kind of went off in a little sequestered area with a small team and built those products and then launched them and a lot of people at microsoft didn't even know those products were coming so um it seemed like he was going to try to do that again then they killed the courier project supposedly steve Ballmer said no we're not going to do it and next thing you know you hear jay allard's quitting um hmm. jay allard denies he quit because the courier was canceled that's what I had heard when I first heard he might leave. So he's really, I mean, he was the guy that we all sang his praises with Xbox and uh, Zoom. Uh, was it Zoom? I mean, he's really like the, yep. he's like the consumer guy, the God, the man who knows what, he, what humans want. <laughs> yes, that's how they positioned him anyway. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so... Uh, do you think it's credible that it was all about the courier? I don't think it was all about the courier. Um, there is a reorg going on, right? There is. Right. So, you know, he leaves. It's announced that he's leaving the same day that it's announced Robbie Bach is retiring. And Robbie Bach is the president of the Entertainment and Devices Division. Right. So they're going to disband his entire division. They're going to have the mobile guy and the gaming guy report straight to Steve Ballmer. So, in, in effect, Ballmer is now running mobile and gaming. Does that send a chill? It sends a chill down my <laughs> spine. Does that send a chill down others, or is it just my imagination? He doesn't. Steve doesn't seem like the guy for that. Maybe they need. Um, maybe it's until they find somebody. Well, well but he's know, not yeah, running engineering. I think it's until they find somebody. He's not running engineering. Right. He's running strategy. Right. Uh, and he always has been. Let's be clear. Ultimately, the, I guess huh? he's the CEO, yeah. and his background is sales and uh, and and partner opportunities. So that's always been uh, his his bailiwick. Um, you know, I don't know why they decided to yank you know yank these two guys out of their chairs right now, but it might be just because they decided that. Uh, I th I have a feeling that in both cases the the product teams have um, reached a point in their engineering where they're done 
and now they're just you know they're 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 uh, getting things ready to ship you know bug, final bug fixes final polish getting ready to hand off to device makers in the case of uh, Windows Phone 7 and and stuff so the engineering part is done and uh, and now they have to get all of the partnership and marketing agreements so it makes sense to have somebody uh, come on board now uh, to to take over that. I don't think that Steve is going to be in charge of that for very long. Right. No, I don't either. Um, there was a, there was I an also... interesting story. Did you see the 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 story? Was it Briar Dudley, who uh, who noted that uh, the CEO of T Mobile USA resigned this week, and he's up in Redmond. Um, <laughs> Something's going on in Redmond. There was a kind of weird rumor that Microsoft might buy T Mobile. Well, or that they might hire him to run uh, that division. Huh. You do you do wonder why these big companies don't just buy a, f a phone company. They've all got lots of cash on hand. Yeah. And maybe they just don't want to get in that business. But it seems like... Well, Microsoft, yeah. that's, that's the opposite of Microsoft's business model. And it's the opposite of Apple's business model. It has been up to now, hasn't it? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and well, uh, but Microsoft sells licenses. Right. For software, if they want to get into the, they want to get into the uh, manufacturing business for uh, for products. In fact, what I wrote well, really, a few months I mean, think about it, a phone company is just a service because they don't they don't they don't build the handsets either. They don't build the handsets either. Yeah. They so have, you're you're uh, buying you're buying the pipes is kind of what you're buying. Right. So it's almost like the motion picture industry owning the theaters. You own the distribution. Wouldn't be a necessarily. Well, I don't know if it'd be approved. It wouldn't be a necessarily a bad part of the business. Then, then, then it's HTC that's buying the software, or right. whatever. I don't know. That's a crazy idea. It's a big. You know, it's a big mess in this country. It is such Honestly. a mess <laughs> compared to any. Well, it's, and this is the this is actually the the, the tragedy of being first. Uh, you know, they often say the reason that uh, the Germany has become such an industrial giant is because it was raised in World War II, so they could start fresh. And we have this disadvantage of we kind of created the cell phone industry, so there's this great mishmash of standards and 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 legacy equipment. It's not good. It's the same thing in the operating system business, isn't it? I mean, you you know, Microsoft. One of the things that holds Microsoft back is legacy. Or is it my broadening painting too broad? Of? Well, it, it, everything you know, it, it's it's their greatest strength and their greatest weakness. Right. Um, when when things are working well and there's a good roadmap. It takes you uh, in, into the future, then compatibility, backwards compatibility, is your best friend. When you have something that's um, broken and unpopular and replaced by uh, a very popular, very successful product like the iPhone, um, backwards compatibility becomes uh, a, a, a great burden uh, and, uh, and something to overcome at you know, with 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 great pain, so that's the position that Microsoft finds themselves in right now. Right. Yep. Getting back to this reorg thing, this is not something unusual for Microsoft. In fact, uh, they they do this fairly frequently. It seems like, yeah, they do. Correct. Um, and you know, the timing is always kind of. Sometimes it's announced at the end of the year. Sometimes beginning of the year. Sometimes it's like mid year review. So. They always are shuffling people around and changing up teams and all that. And, you know, when I, when I wrote about Bach and Allard leaving, I said, you know, both of the guys have, have been there and they've been strong for their teams or whatever. But it's also good to shake things up, too. And um, it's a, it seems, I agree with that, it's like a good time right now for them to be shaking things up. In the, in the product cycle. In the product cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Allard's title was Chief Experience Officer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew, yeah, I remember it was something um, like that. Lofty. Yeah. I remember meeting him when Xbox came out. You know, my, my dog just walked into the room and reminded me that I have not fed them lunch yet. Go so. ahead and feed the dog's will lunch. You, will you <laughs> go ahead and feed the dog's I'll, lunch. I'll be back, I'll be back in hungry, 60 seconds. We don't want hungry uh, canines. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. They might start the gnawing on my yes. leg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he did Zune. He uh, did yes. Xbox. Yep. And um, do we know where he's going? He is staying on, he, he's staying on as an advisor to Microsoft. Okay. Um, and also, he's going to go do some things in extreme adventure sports, which is like his big passion. <laughs> he yeah. said he said his life up to now has been 95% Microsoft, 5% living, and he's going to flip the ratio yeah. and do 5% right. Microsoft and then live. And, I, you know, I'm sure these guys make enough money and enough stock yes. 
that at, at a certain point you just go, I, you know, I've been working really hard. Maybe I could climb a rock for a while. <laughs> exactly. Now. Yep. Now, this isn't the only change. Uh, there's something called Windows Web Services now. Yes. What is that? Yeah, so there were a bunch of weird little fallout things that got kind of over overshadowed by the actual reorg. But one of the things I thought was interesting was um, Microsoft took this guy named Antoine LeBlond, who has been part of the Office team for a while. And he moved. they moved him under Steven Sanofsky on Windows. And he's going to be running a project called Windows Web Services. So nobody knows what this is, really. Um, it's not Windows Live. Um, it has something to do with Windows Update, but Microsoft's not saying anything beyond that, pretty much. It's just like he's going to be running some project that I bet we're going to hear more about as we start hearing about Windows 8. Steve that's, Ballmer's that's all, yeah. email I'm quoting you says, Integral Windows services that today deliver updates, solutions, community, and depth information for the Windows consumer. Yeah, it was that last that one, depth information. <laughs> <laughs> that was the one... I, it, uh, yeah. I love I love corporate speak. I just love it. <laughs> no idea what that means. So, but it's yeah. not Windows Live, which it sounds yeah. like it's Windows Live, or it sounds like yeah. maybe under you know Ray Ozzy or something. But it's not. It's and not they in fact specifically said it's not Windows. It's not Live, cloud. Right? It's something yep. else. Yep. Okay. A yep. new engine. Another interesting. Go ahead. Another interesting little tidbit. Leo, I think, will care a lot about was they also are going to take the Mac business unit at Microsoft and they're moving that into Office. But because that's really what it is, right? It's it's, yeah, it's, it's Office for it the is. Macintosh. But yeah. yeah, so a, a lot of people have been tweeting and guessing like, oh, so this must mean finally Windows Office and Mac Office are going to get even more alike and have better interoperability and all that. I mean, you, you'd hope and assume, but that was an interesting they, They've been kind of in a real staggered schedule, but they've gotten closer because the Mac Office is due this fall, I think. And, uh, yeah. and of course... Office 2010 just came out. So they're, it used to be a year off. So now they're a little bit closer. Maybe they will at some point uh, Maybe. merge. A new engineering chief, Kurt Delbean, senior vice president of Office Business Productivity Group, is now head of the engineering responsibilities for the office business. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, former live platform services head, David Treadwell, moves out of the window. I don't know why I'm reading this out loud. This is just yeah. kind of, this is the they usual. They some people around, yeah. <laughs> it, the, the one thing that's kind of odd is that they're not replacing Robbie Bach, but that's not unusual, I guess. No. They've done it before where you just say, we don't right. need that person anymore. We well, and they realign business uh, business organizations. They combine things. Uh, you know, a lot of it is, wh where does the entertainment stuff go? Um, right. And where does the devices stuff go? And are they the same? Because you have uh, entertainment. The, if you think of Zoom and Xbox Live as services that can go on, P on PCs, and then you think of multiple devices that they have, which can be phones and such, you know, are those, um, the, the entertainment thing covers the entire spectrum of hardware that Microsoft is about, whereas the devices category is, uh, is very specific. It actually means phones now. Um, yeah. and, you know, uh, so it, it does make sense to sort of, from a strategic point of view, to rethink that organization. But does it mean the yeah, end I'm curious, of entertainment? I'm kind of curious where um, Surface ends up in all of this. Surface? Microsoft. You they, know that big, they still big, sell, ass the big, ta big ass table. They still sell that? Yeah, they still sell that. And, um, you know, that technology is, is informing kind of what they're doing with touch in, in other divisions. So they, they don't know. They say where they're going to put Surface yet. Is huh. it going to go to Windows? Is it going to go to gaming? Hmm. We don't know. Because yeah, touch is now everywhere in everything mm -hmm. they do. Right. So Surface, you think, is the R&D for touch is where the touch begins? Yeah. I mean, I think it, I think it was kind of where they made a first major stand on multi-touch. Right. Yeah, that's right. And why did they kill Courier? I mean, what? I, okay, given that kill, Courier was the real deal, which is, I didn't. Well, let's, let, you know, I, to answer that question, I think you have to take a step back and, um, and say, uh, was Courier that device in the one concept video? Uh, and I think the answer is no. Ah. I, I think that there was an effort to say, is it possible for us to come up with something that is sort of uh, a, uh, a well-managed reference device uh, in a tablet form factor that, um, that we can build, sell, develop, 
uh, license, you know, whatever the business model is there. But it was basically, I, I, my guess is that what that was all about was taking their tablet technology and saying, can we productize this? Uh, and they just said, you know, we, we can't. Uh, we, yeah. at, least, at least that's not a place where we want to spend a lot of R&D dollars right now. Yeah. I have yeah. to think that there might be uh, that Microsoft might be in a bad position when it comes to tablets. When you see HP acquiring WebOS, it really feels like they acquired that because they felt like a tablet, like the Slate that they had pre-announced, but then decided not to do. Maybe they had said, maybe this shouldn't be running Windows Seven. What do you guys think on uh, about yeah. Windows Seven on tablet? Yeah. There's an well, amazing think, number of assumptions in that statement. Yeah, Leo. there are. There <laughs> okay, are. Like okay. <laughs> let's, let's. The one we don't know about HP. We don't know if they're still making the yeah. Windows 7 tab. So, so that was just a rumor that they had ki killed Slate. Right. right. They never confirmed that. They won't confirm it, and Microsoft won't confirm it. Right. And in so, fact, uh, and in fact, exactly the opposite. I think didn't um, uh, Phil Phil McKinney is that his name? Uh, didn't he just say last week? Don't believe everything you read. Ah. Okay. Uh, yeah. In in a at at a a big HP schmooze fest uh, that they had, but he yeah, but I think he said so it, it, very pointedly not um, acknowledging uh, that rumor, but also sort of saying, hey, uh, you know, it it, uh, it it might be completely wrong. Well, you I think while you can make a case that that one of the reasons touch computers haven't done well in the past is that Windows wasn't very well suited to tablet computing. And I, I, I say that even though there's, there are fanatics who just love it, but it just never yeah. was a huge product. That Windows 7, in contrast, really does have a lot of touch and multi-touch built in. Maybe maybe somebody convinced, maybe somebody's saying, well, we should not assume that Windows does not belong on a tablet just because it hasn't succeeded in the past. Right. Right. Okay. Yep. But why is HP buying WebOS? <laughs> I think they're buying it more for the uh, the phone, right? Like that's going to I mean they will have a they said they will have a webOS tablet, but they didn't have a mobile play really. Right. Until they bought them. They had the iPad. <laughs> yeah. <Woo -hoo. laughs> HP has HP has been making uh mobile devices um uh, from handheld to uh 17 inch and 20 inch notebooks for as long as I can remember the, the full full range of of them so it is not they have always been in the mobile device mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. and so this is not out of out of character for them right. at all uh, my guess is also that it was um, almost an irresistible price for them uh, they got some engineering assets out of it. They undoubtedly got some patents out of it. They mm. didn't get the the UI guy who just went yep. over to work for Google. Yep. Um, but they, you know, but they they uh, a company the size of HP with as much cash as they have in the bank. I don't think for them this is a uh, you know this is this this is not a huge uh, acquisition. And there's lots of ways that they can use that technology. What's sixteen million here or there? It's not really a, <laughs> right. just a little chump change. Does Microsoft? I mean, there has been this kind of deafening silence. Uh, there were all these tablets at CES, many of which were running uh, Windows. And you know, where are they? Are they coming? Is, is are people saying, "Well, let's reassess now that we've seen Apple's tablet"? Well, the PC ecosystem launches products in the fall, so it's so they're coming in the fall. Yeah. Well, uh, if they're going to come, they're coming in the fall. I don't think it's uh, you know Apple tends to launch its products at the beginning of the year. That's right. the way right. that's the way they work. Um, but the PC ecosystem is all about the ho the holiday selling season, and you tend to find um, you know big launches of, of stuff in the fall, uh, especially because a lot of hardware companies just had big refreshes last fall with the launch of, of Windows 7, um, they would, you know, it would make sense for them to have, uh, a, you know, they, and they do annual uh, refreshes. So I would expect if there's going to be any movement in that area to, to start seeing a lot of things after Labor Day. Right. And, and so good. But do you, do you like to uh, remember that wonderful Lenovo, you know, yeah. d detachable thing? Swivel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of really cool things and i do think windows 7 i think people don't realize how how good windows 7 is with touch i do think well i have a touch i have a, a, a dell latitude xt2 right here by my side uh and it's a great 
um, it's a great tablet PC. Uh, it has the uh, it it can be a, a touch computer when you want it to right. be. It can be a notebook when you want it to be. Um, the thing is that um, it's not optimized for either of of those things. So somebody who just wants one or the other, uh, you know, is going to find themselves uh, a, a little bit disappointed. Uh, somebody who wants both of those things is in a, a niche about. You know about the <laughs> big. I and, have you know, so, I have I have an HP uh, tablet from uh, about four or five years ago that's sitting right here, and you know I mean there were a lot of these for a while. I mean the, Bill Gates was the, was Mr. Tablet. Yeah. But I'll, I'll I'll tell you what though I would expect. Uh, so you've got you know what's interesting is that look at what happened. Look, look at the uh, progression of technology from Windows Vista to Windows Seven. Right, Windows Vista. A um, lot of people were unhappy about it, and yet the, all of the architecture that's in there is the basic architecture of Windows Seven. So what they did with Windows Seven was to go in and refine, polish, and uh, and fix the things that um, either either needed refining and polishing or needed fixing. I think uh, in terms of of uh, the tablet technology, the idea of Taking Windows Seven and turning it into a dedicated tablet is um, is not good, because it was never designed to be a dedicated tablet. If I had to guess, and this is pure guesswork on my part, but if I had to guess, there is going to be uh, a significant effort in Windows Eight to be able to flip a switch software-wise on that, where it will run in a dedicated tablet mode uh. and it will run very well because all the technology I can I you know I can give you a very impressive demo of a bunch of things on this tablet you know which is using modern hardware and uh, and Windows 7 but you know ultimately it's got a bunch of the cruft and right. and uh, baggage that goes with uh, a, a desktop mouse and keyboard driven platform on it there which sort of interferes with the experience so i think you have to you know if you so if you if you look at what vista and how vista turned into 7 i think it's highly likely that we will see the windows 7 touch and tablet type features turned into a more polished more interesting um, product in i'm, the kind, of, 8 I'm, I'm kind of the opinion that the um that these tablets are better with a mobile operating system than a shrunken desktop operating system. But the only reason you think that is because uh, the only people who've designed one of those so far have been, uh, who've designed a device that is dedicated for touch, have been uh, uh, people Apple and Google. using people using mobile. Right. Uh, people using operating systems that are that are like that. I w you could actually put if you if you put a you know some good software engineers into a room, uh, f you know for six months or so and uh, and let them hide the the desktop parts of Windows and build uh, a a um, you know, a Windows 7 machine that is, is, you know, completely optimized for touch, doesn't have a keyboard, doesn't have a mouse. They, they could deliver a very, very interesting product to you I think, on that. I think it's also, I think Ed might agree with this too. There's, there's like a corporate policy and statement at Microsoft that Windows 7 is our operating system for tablets. That's like, that's it. Palmer even said that this week when somebody said to him, why not put like Windows Phone OS on, right. on a tablet? And he right. said, no, that's not what we're doing. But I think we are going to see some OEMs do that. And it'll be interesting to compare those kind of tablets running Windows Phone OS with tablets running Windows 8 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no kidding. But you like. But they could also run Windows Embedded. Right. They could. Right. With a shell, yeah. a specialized shell yeah, or yeah. something. A touch yeah. shell. Yeah. Um, but you like the X-T2 a lot, uh, Ed. I do. It's a it's a it's a very nice very nice computer. The twelve eighty by eight hundred screen. But it said, here's one example of the um, the trade offs that you have to do with it. It's a twelve eighty by eight hundred screen, but in order for the touch features to really work well, you have to um, bump the the dots per inch on it up so that all of the objects on the so screen are touch big. Yeah. Well, right. And so at, then at that point, you've got things that are uh, you've got some things that are 
perfectly sized, but some things that are just too big. Right. And so you don't have a lot of, uh, and, and, and so what you really want is for a UI designer, and this is what Apple has done extremely well with the iPad, is for a UI designer to say, this needs to be big, this needs to be small, mm -hmm. this needs to a uh, hundred percent of a web page size, and uh, you know, and then you wind up with a device that's optimized for it. So I don't think it's the fact that they chose an, an optimized or a, a mobile OS for that device that is important. It's that they they it, optimized it, it for that. They designed yeah. the hardware and the software right. to work perfectly together. Right. Right. Now, okay, take an iPad. Put it into one of those uh, pretty little stands there, and attach a keyboard to it, and uh, and now and it's not and such a good experience. <laughs> well, it, it, it's great until you have to select some text right. because it doesn't support Can't a mouse. Can't do it. Can't do it. Yep. You have to reach out with your finger and yep. actually use your finger as sort of a, a, a lousy mouse. And so there's the optimization that they deliberately right. chose not to do. Right. That makes sense, though. They chose. They said this is the form factor. This is what it's going to. This is how it's going to be. And that yeah, makes a lot of yeah. sense. And it's interesting because Dell in their ad for, or their, uh, their page for the X-T2 shows uh, a uh, x-ray, shows a radiologist using it, which I think is a big niche, the medical niche for a touch for tablets in general. We're going to take a break. I just like, I just like having it when I'm uh, on an airplane. I like being able to, um, uh, to flip it over so that the keyboard is hidden. And if I'm reading things. Perfect for that. You know, I, yeah. Uh, it's perfect, and the guy in front of me, when he leans his thing back, is not Does going it, to crush my computer. Yeah, I, I have it. That. You know, I just have it. You know, sort of propped up on my, you know, on my knee or on the or on the tray table there, and uh, and I can actually work with it. Where with a, uh, you know, a fourteen inch or larger uh, notebook, uh, I might not be able to get anything done at all. Ed Bott is with us from uh, ZDNet. He's a Microsoft veteran, Microsoft Watcher, former editor in chief of uh, PC Computing, and an old friend. It's great to have you here, Ed, and of course Mary Jo Foley. Who, yes, I know she's upside down. It's funny people come into the chat and they go, um, "Do you know that Mary Jo's upside down?" <laughs> no, really, <laughs> really. <laughs> she says she bought the well we figured it out you bought the australian version of the asus laptop and that's that the it. problem yeah. yes there yeah. we go yeah <laughs> so uh, we know that but you know what it doesn't matter because all the good uh, intelligent stuff is spilling right into the show right out of the top of her head so mary joe foley is also here uh who is uh the author of all things the all about microsoft a blog uh, and also also of microsoft 2.0 from wiley and sons Mary Jo is on Twitter at Mary as Mary Jo Foley, M A R Y J O F O L E Y. Ed Bott is E D B O T T on Twitter. And we will continue in just a bit with these two. Paul Therott, in case you didn't hear me at the beginning, has the week off because he's in Lisbon enjoying the fine wine. I don't know why. I just get the impression of, of, of Paul drinking out of a Boda bag like this all week. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> why <laughs> just that's you know a lot of sangria pouring in there and i don't know maybe it's just my imagination and maybe not uh, i do want to mention our friends at carbonite pro if you've ever seen uh, or heard me talk about carbonite you know that uh, I, this is this is to me exactly what backup should be automatic so you don't have to think about it uh, encrypted so it's absolutely private and in the cloud so if the worst happens there's a fire or a flood or something terrible happens uh, to your computer and, and maybe your backup as well, thieves break in and steal it all, you still have a good backup you can rely on up on the cloud, up at Carbonite servers. But in fact, so many people like this, that even though it's aimed at consumers, it's, it's a computer per computer solution, that a lot of small businesses are starting to use Carbonite. And Carbonite found this out and said, wait a minute, we're missing, we're missing an opportunity here. They have designed Carbonite Pro for you small business owners a single account a single dashboard can back up all the computers in your enterprise it's all automatic it's all encrypted so you're absolutely secure using aes 256 bit encryption the strongest encryption you can get you control the keys you know privacy is guaranteed and i know that's important when your financials and so forth are going up we're using it and then i completely trust it but the point is you can get that data back and imagine what it would be what it would mean to your business if a disaster happens, you lose not only your computers, but you lose the backup, the local backup, your network attached storage drives, your SAN. You're out of business. I mean, how do you reconstruct all that? You get you have paper? What are you gonna enter it all in again? 
That's why you've got to have a good backup solution, and it has to include a cloud solution, and I think Carbonite Pro is a great choice. Give it a try right now. You get a month free. This is a great way to see how it works, get the feel for it. Um, it just go to CarbonitePro.com. You can sign up. One month free. Windows only right now. They are working on a Mac solution, but most businesses are running on Windows, let's face it. So I think this is a good choice for all of you. CarbonitePro.com. 30 days free. Backup done right. Oh, and did I mention, and I love this, as somebody who for a long time at where I worked for ZD, when you lose the data, you know, accidentally trash the file, you're going to show the boss that afternoon or you, you know, accidentally screw up your hard drive. You have to make that perp walk down the hall to IT and beg them to restore your data. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> Carbonite Pro, you can let your users restore their own data. They don't have to bug you. CarbonitePro.com, great for small business. Give it a try uh, today. One of the things we didn't mention on the reorg, and uh, I know this is of special interest to you, uh, Mary Jo, is uh, yes. Rebecca Norlander. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, there, there, there aren't a lot of women at Microsoft. Is that the case? No, there are. There must be. Um, about a one quarter of the employees of Microsoft are women, but um, executive wise, very few. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so Re Rebecca Norlander, for people who don't know, is Jay Allard's wife. And she, she stayed. Has, she, well, she, we don't know what she's going to do. She actually is between jobs right now ah. at Microsoft. She says she's looking around inside the company for what she wants to do next. Uh, but I wonder if. Jay Allard quitting is going to influence her direction at all. Is she an engineer? Is her background She tech? is. Yes. She's an engineer, and uh, she was Ray Ozzie's technical assistant for a few years, and she managed uh, the XPSP2 project. She's done a lot of pretty high-profile things at Microsoft. Does Microsoft, I mean, of course, uh, uh, there are women in HR, probably in public relations. Do they make an effort to get en women in engineering uh, they and do. management? They um, do. They do make an effort. Um, there's fewer people to choose from um, out there. There are, I think, like 12% of engineering graduates are women right now. But they, they try to get people from unconventional backgrounds uh, and kind of get them on the, on the uh, computer science engineering track if that isn't something they picked originally. Yeah. So that's, I mean, they're trying, but there still aren't very many of them. You know, we, uh, we just lost our director of engineering, uh, Colleen Kelly, to Google. Um, and I'm sure one of the reasons Google was thrilled to, to snap her up is because she's a very talented female engineer. And, um, and you know, there are people like Jerry Ellsworth, who's the chip designer we've had on before. But you're right. They're, they, they're so few that, that you, they stand out. Yep. And uh, maybe we can do something about that. But that, that's good. Well, I'm, we'll watch Rebecca Norlander uh, with yes. interest to see what happens. So at Google I.O., um, Google really pushed the HTML5 strategy. Um, I think they did a lot of FUD about uh, Apple and a little bit about Microsoft, too. Microsoft's response, uh, we've got an HTML5 strategy. What is Microsoft's HTML <laughs> HTML5 strategy? Well, well uh, you know, they, they, uh, they have promised uh, full support in for nine. HTML5 in, in IE9. Uh, they're not going to go back and redo IE8. They're going to, you know, in in uh, in IE9. And but that um, way I should point out, HTML5 isn't a standard yet, and so it makes sense. I mean, it's not like you can rush and do it now because there's no standard yet. Exactly. Um, that that's that's exactly right. Completely fact, appropriate to uh, wait. The the two the their two biggest rivals, um, uh, web you know the, the Mozilla and WebKit uh, engines have proprietary tags in their implementations of HTML5 right now because they have to because there aren't any standards for those things. Um, you know, it's, I mean, so, but that's sort of the nature of standards. That's what the way that Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi draft end standard worked for years. There did come a point where you could say, okay, we know it's going to be this and we can build products based on it. Um, but there is still a lot of stuff that's up in the air about HTML5. But I think the thing that's most interesting, the one thing that got all the attention last week was about the, uh, the video format is going to be supported natively. Right. And, uh, and so um, Microsoft is going to ship an H.264 codec, and they're, and they're going to support playback through that in IE9 with Windows. And, and the reason that the Mozilla didn't want to do that is because, and, and Microsoft, and, and we should point out Apple as well, both support H.264, is because the, for them, $5 million yearly license fee is nothing. 
But Mozilla has an open source. Well, actually, truthfully, for Mozilla, it's probably nothing too. It, but, for Mozilla, <laughs> it's for Mozilla, it's probably nothing uh, either, except that you have to pay it. Uh, you have to pay it on the basis of of how many products you ship, and since it's a free product, you can't really audit those uh, those right. those things particularly well. Right. And uh, so they know, could they wouldn't even know how to pay for it, I guess. They, you know, they would have to do uh, one of those ugly things that people did, um, that Microsoft did in the XP era, which is that if you wanted uh, an MP3 encoder back then, you had to go out and download it. and pay. Pay right. ten bucks, right. five or ten bucks, and and download it. And uh, now, and ironically, it. that's kind of how Microsoft said it's going to support VP8 slash WebM. This new Google codec is we'll support it, but you got to download the codec. Well, but but uh, so all you have to do is, uh, but I, I don't understand how that's different from the way things work now. Microsoft does not have support for QuickTime files right. in Windows, right. and so you have so you, you have get, get QuickTime. Right. You go get QuickTime. You install the 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 QuickTime software and and uh, Shazam. Well, that, well, that makes it a second class. Videos. That makes it second class citizen, though. I mean, the, you know, the first class citizens on our platform are the ones where you don't have to get a plug-in, you know, uh, Flash uh, and H.264. You don't need a plug-in for that, right? It plays. Uh, Flash, you have to download. Flash. Yeah, but it comes with. Well, I guess you're. I guess you're right. I mean. It, it, yeah. Right. It, it doesn't kinda, cost anything. It yeah, kind of comes Adobe with it, doesn't though. charge a licensing right. fee. Uh, All right, for, you're right, you're right, you're right. To install it. Does eight, but yeah. H.264, that plays natively, does it not? You, do, you don't have to get anything for that, do you? Well, they will, no, you will not have to get anything That'll with that. With they will install the, the codec with that. And, my, and now, the other thing to think about here is that this is not just sort of Microsoft's arbitrary decision where we're going to pick this one. This is the industry's decision. H.264 is the primary codec used for Blu-ray discs. It is it is supported in the silicon of it's just about right. every modern right. video adapter. So you have you know the Nvidia is. has built an AT, all of these have built in H.264 encode and decode on and, the on, on the, the hardware. Chip. So so when you so when you play back an H.264 file, um, the amount of CPU usage is very very low. Right. Uh, uh, whereas with other formats that even though they may be able to compress to the same size as uh, the H.264 codec, they're not going to be able to take advantage of that hardware acceleration. And as a result, you're either going to have crummy performance on some devices uh, or you're, uh, you know, or you're going to have, you know, very high uh, CPU usage, the, the very things that people have complained about with Flash, and for example. And for portable devices, it's bad for battery. Very bad. Yeah. Yep. So um, it seems like then Microsoft's just saying we're going to we're going to support standards and we'll support this WebM in uh, just as we support Flash. You download a plugin. That seems like a sensible response. I, I you know it doesn't it so, you know so then there was a lot of talk about Og Theora. You yeah, know, yeah, which is yeah, another, yeah. you know, uh, another standard there. I mean, look, if you go back to, uh, again, go back uh, almost 10 years now to when uh, Windows XP was being developed, go and look at the list of codecs, video codecs and audio codecs that were supported by the operating system back there. It was just enormous. Um, and, and it was a real problem. Uh, and each one of those codecs that you uh, install represents a potential security issue. Right. Uh, that has to be patched and maintained. Each one of them represents a potential source of instability and um, and uh, you know problems, crashes on the on the platform or slowdowns in performance. Uh, and and so the idea of saying, look, we're going to go with the industry standard from other software companies, other hardware companies, uh, you know, you know, just seems. Logical. You wrote me. a really good post, which uh, a couple of weeks ago, which I quoted uh, uh, on this week ago, or maybe it was on Twit, about the actual cost. Because there, because there are a couple of concerns about H.264. One is that, that, that it's patent encumbered, and that it someday MPEG LA, which is a consortium of rights holders, might suddenly, you know, say, "Hey, it's been free up till now." Just as just as Unisys started to do with GIF, but now we right. want some money here. Uh, but you point this out. This is not going to be a problem. Well, yeah, I went back and looked at the, you know, I actually um, did, you know, shockingly, some reporting. Shocking. Uh, looked up the numbers. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> looked up the numbers. If you are playing back video um, 
uh, and not charging your users for it, there's no fee due. If you have a commercial service, uh, it, you know, so you have a subscription-based video service, a Hulu, for example, and you used H.264 as your as your format, the uh, licensing fee would be the equivalent of a couple of pennies per month per sub, uh, for each subscriber that you have there for uh, software that is not an operating system for you know for the uh, for companies that make uh, video playback software and such the cost ranges from 10 uh, it, it's free up for the first hundred thousand units that you ship each year so if you really are a small company you don't have to pay and there's and a then, cap and and there's a cap and after that it's basically it uh, it starts at 20 cents and goes down to uh, 10 cents um, per uh, per copy that you've sold. So if you're selling, so the so the people who are who are complaining the most and and justifiably have uh, a cause to complain are those who believe that all software should be free, because um, uh, throwing a dime into a free software package uh, they don't have a they don't have a model for collecting right. that. Um, you know, so the uh, but I think you know the uh, I, I think Ubuntu has figured out a way to to deal with that. Um, you know, I recall. I mean, I'm not an expert on that, but they do. But they have my that, credit card number uh, now, <laughs> so they yeah. they, 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 there is some sort of means of doing that. Yeah, yeah. There's you know repositories uh, for those. That, there's commercial repositories and free repositories. Ubuntu so there does are, some interesting things. Of, for instance, there's a proprietary driver uh, for my lap. I have a Dell 17 that I. With Linux on, the reason I'm it's fresh in my mind. I put Ubuntu on it at dual boot with uh, uh, Windows Seven, which it does very nicely automatically. And it says when you boot it up, there's a proprietary uh, ATI driver that this machine could use. We don't supply it, but if you want, we'll install it. Uh, just uh, just understand that that you're going to have to get any patches from the manufacturer. It's not going to be part of our upgrade. And then uh, if you give them a credit card, you can uh, absolutely buy commercial stuff. And uh, there's Ubuntu One, and there's all sorts of They've, I think they've, they've, they've handled this very gracefully, actually. Um, Mozilla might have more of a problem because they're not going to set up, you know, who's going to give the Mozilla their credit card? So do you think, that, <laughs> do you think WebM is um, then, what is the point of WebM? Because, by the way, Mike, both Microsoft and Apple both say this may also be encumbered by patents. It may not be uh, as open and free as Google asserts. Yeah. So, so what's the point then? Is this just Google? Uh... I think it's in part it is anything but Microsoft, right? I mean, right. And you can't totally blame them. This this is how they're trying to compete. So, and they, anything but Apple, you, right? right and, and anything and, but Apple. I yeah. think it's so interesting how the industry is now kind of making these alliances. In the and it, it, you guys have followed this for a while, as have I. But I don't. I can't remember this kind of uh, stratification of the in, of the industry before like this. And the viciousness between Google and Apple, I, is that precedented? Um, I remember we used to say uh, uh, Windows ain't done till Lotus won't run. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. But that wasn't you know on this you, level. But you know what you have right now, uh, what, which you've never had before? You have three companies, each of which has a monopoly. Right. Okay? Um, and right. each one of them, uh, and, and uh, two of them are unregulated monopolies. Uh, and and so what you've got is each one of them trying as best they can to leverage their monopoly platform to grow in the areas where they don't have monopolies. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, Microsoft is severely constrained in their ability to leverage their monopoly because the government they're actually still so. under government <laughs> right. supervision. Right. Um, and and uh, there are lawyers who will be in there in a heartbeat uh, right. to stop them from doing anything like that. Whereas Google with its monopoly in search and Apple with its monopoly in, uh, in digital music uh, have, uh, have, are both doing their best to extend those strengths out into, uh, into other areas. And so I think that's, that's really what you're seeing here. Um, and there isn't even a model in the, in the movie industry. You know, normally it's Predator versus Alien or you know, Godzilla versus Mothra. There isn't really a, a precedent for three um, giant uh, monsters. Yeah, somebody uh, said I was confusing Mozilla with Godzilla, but I but it, but it is <laughs> it is kind of like that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the original Mozilla is you know sort of a a, a cute looking uh, orange Godzilla. Yeah, that's yeah. right, breathing fire. 
Um, no, that's a very good point. And so they're yeah. and they're each trying to assert their monopoly into the other person's kind of space. And that's very interesting. You're right. I don't think it's been like this before. Uh, Three dimensional chess. It is. You know, it's like Star Trek uh, chess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but and, and that is in a way a sign of maturity of the industry uh, that that we that they've gotten to this point now where they can be so dominant. Uh, and there's so much money to be made. Now, uh, oh, your but your colleague uh, John Carroll, uh, in uh, his uh, ZDNet blog, a developer's view, talks says that uh, Google TV is going to cost Microsoft the TV space. Mary Jo, does that seem like that's that Google TV is that big a threat to a media center? Well, you know, Ed Ed knows more about media center than me, but. And I was watching all the tweets go by as Google was previewing Google TV and pretty much without exception, people were saying media centers had yeah. a lot, if not all of the stuff yeah. before. And I was so underwhelmed. Like yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I think John Carroll's column was really interesting because he used to work for Microsoft in the TV division. Ah. So he, you know, you think, okay, he's probably going to root for Microsoft and say, you know, Microsoft had some pretty cool stuff, but he makes some very interesting points there about it's Microsoft's to lose, and they have a lot right. of things right now that are in disarray in their TV strategy. Um, and, you know, competition between Media Center and Xbox, between IPTV and other things they're doing in TV. So he, I think he made a very interesting case. Like, Microsoft needs to get its own house in order, or it's just going to lose by attrition almost. Right. The, the one, the, the, uh, I agree completely with that. It was a, uh, and actually, John had a follow up post to that as well, um, which was even longer uh, and equally insightful. They were both really, really, really good reading uh, for people who are interested in this sort of thing. I think the, the most telling thing, though, is that, um, you know, at the moment, Microsoft doesn't have a, a media center team to speak of. They were sort of... Right. That, that they're um, gone. They were they were sort of broken apart and divided up between the you know the Zoom team and the the Windows Mobile team and you know off to various parts of the infrastructure and uh, so I I uh, I do believe there are a couple of of interesting efforts at work uh, in Microsoft that are probably connected with uh, the uh, the mysterious web services um, mm. Windows Windows web services that we were talking Maybe about that's that, the that this depth. is all. We're right that this is all turning into, right. but um, uh, but in the meantime, so but Microsoft does not have the ability to react to this until Windows 8, and uh, and Windows 8 is a 2012. So they're, they're just going to be on the sidelines until that happens. Well, they they still have they still have Media Center, but there's nothing uh, you know. Well, here's seem here's one of the things Carol says is that the thing that's he finds the most frustrating is Xbox, which is the only device. Uh, Microsoft, only TV attached product made by Microsoft. Right. Um, and he says it doesn't make any sense to restrict the network access of custom applications. He says, unless you're Facebook, Netflix, Last FM, you, you, you can't use that Ethernet or Wi Fi connection in the Xbox. And that's, a, and that's a great point that he makes, which is that basically the Xbox 360 is um, the only credible competitor to and it Google could, TV And it right could now. be so good. It, you know, it, it could be awesome, and it could probably be done fairly, uh, fairly quickly. Um, you know, they could is, open that up where, very quickly, uh, sure. This is, where, this is where normally we would just sit back and let Paul go on for about <laughs> uh, 20 yeah, he has this is his this is his area isn't it maybe next week yeah. we'll find out what he thinks but this, <laughs> absolutely this is his area he's he watches a lot of tv when he's drinking from that boda bag it's the, <laughs> he's, got, he's watching this he's, right now he's, and he's, going, oh. he's going oh my show my show <laughs> i'll get you laporte <laughs> I'll but, get but, you. Thinking, but the other thing i think that um that they that microsoft really desperately needs to do is uh, to come up with different flavors of the Xbox 360. Uh, some things that are What would are not... you do? That's interesting. What would you do? Well, uh, for example, I am not a gamer. I, right. I don't want. Uh, I don't want a game controller. I. I want something that. Uh, in fact, I have a media. I have a small form factor media center uh, PC in my living room attached to the to the. Um, the, the big screen TV and it and it works great, um, but I would much rather have a uh, a dedicated device 
that is basically an Xbox without all that gaming right. silliness in it. That's a set top um, box you're talking about. That yeah, that, but but the but I can already if I get past the the gaming blades, uh, you know, and and all of the Xbox Live stuff, I, I can already kind of get to that with right. uh, with an Xbox 360. I can you know I have to I have to take one path to go to the Media Center Extender mode, and I have to take another path to go to the uh, Xbox Media Player mode. Um, this you know, is so, where Microsoft. I find Microsoft a little frustrating because they yeah, they're so big. And they have so many irons in the fire, but they don't seem to have that laser intensity or laser focus that, uh, well, and Google's not particularly focused, but Apple seems to have yeah. that good focus. And, uh, you know, I, I remember the reason they made the Xbox is because they wanted to make cable companies use a Microsoft set-top box, but the cable company said, well, in order to run your software, we need to make these things so expensive because we have to put more RAM in, bigger processors. It's It, it kills our profit, so we're not going to use Microsoft set-top boxes. So my, I, it's, it's my memory, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, that was one of the reasons why Xbox came along. It was a set, it could be a stealth set-top box. And whoever had that strategy either went <laughs> disappeared or <laughs> forgot about it and said and they made a game machine but and they well, never really well, capitalized well, yeah, well, on they, that. they started targeting only nintendo right uh, right yep. and, and then and then sony as the uh, as the competition but there. now the competition uh, now is very clearly roku and google yeah. and all these other set top boxes that give yeah. you access to the internet well, well it no, comes back the competition again. It is comes back com again to inner inner division competition, right? Oh, it's interesting. Inside Microsoft. Interesting. It's like just like with the tablet, like it, they want it to be Windows Windows uh, based, right. not Windows phone based, right? So, remember there was this whole controversy back in the day with what was going to be the hub of the living room, and right. Bill Gates wanted it to be the PC. Right. They didn't want it to be the TV. Right. You know, so it, it's kind of like different parts of Microsoft have different missions and they're pushing their mission and depending on who's in favor they win right at that time right and that's a problem it is that's a that's a problem yep. it really it keeps them from capitalizing on what is a huge advantage i mean they've got how many millions of xbox 360s on people's tvs hanging well, I want off to the back TV. up uh, a little bit to something that you said there about the competition being roku and and google tv and all this no the competition is your cable company's dvr uh-huh uh, or your which is TV. crap, by the way. They're all <laughs> crap, but you know what? They have, uh, but most people, uh, they have the advantage of you call the cable company, uh, you they, you know, you right. say send the guy out, plug it in, right. and if it breaks, I call you and right. you either help me fix it or you send the guy out and he replaces it. And good luck um, getting a cable card from them if you want to use anything that's not sold by the cable company. Yeah, so you know, so it's uh, well, I, have, I actually haven't had that problem. I've had pretty good luck with cable cards, um, oh, good. but right. the uh, but the uh, but the real issue for you know Google TV seems to be trying to repeat um, Microsoft's mistake, only bigger and, and with but with less revenue. They have a partnership with Dish, so if you are a Dish customer, yeah. Then you then you got this thing, this box that you get from you know your satellite company. Microsoft so. had a partnership with uh, DirecTV for oh, quite man. a while there. They even they even actually demonstrated uh, uh, DirecTV oh, boxes directly connected to media center PCs. Really, and uh, those products existed. Uh, they were they were announced at CES. <laughs> there was a ship schedule. There were test units really? out there. And then DirecTV pulled the plug on it. So until I Do you see, think that was the movie companies that uh, said, no, no, you're not hooking a PC up to this? No, I think it was DirecTV going, you know, um, the. I think it was a combination of the economy right. collapsing. Too expensive, too saying, complicated. It, it's too expensive, it's too complicated. This is going to cost us more in support than we can ever possibly make back on it. Yeah. Let's just cut our losses now. We're not going to ship this. We're not going to ship this product. Interesting. And the people who they would sell it to would be the most uh, demanding um, right. segment. Right. You know, they they would want perfect performance, and they'd be tweaking it and hacking it. And right. And you know, so they. I mean, I think somebody made a legitimate business decision there. Um, but so Dish and Google are going to have the, mm. uh, you know, perhaps the exact same issues. Interesting. Deal. Interesting. Interesting. You predict that this will not ever come out with a Google TV? Oh uh, no, 
I do not. Uh, uh, no, the the you know the one advantage that they have is that they can sort of you know they they could sort of use this. Uh, it's it's Android based, right? So yes. So they would use Android as the basis for their um, you know for a for a dish product. And you know, I don't know what Dish is using now as their platform, right. um, but uh, you know, if if they can cut their licensing costs down uh, for that, it it could be actually enough to make it worthwhile for them. But you know, it's it's not a high margin business, and it's not a fun business to be in. So I should save the E three conversation for when Paul gets back, because he, after all, is like the big gamer, right? Yeah, we're. I, I'm just gonna, you know, I'll, I'll just scratch my head. And, you know. <laughs> Same. Uh, yeah, because yeah, we're gonna, we, uh, we are gonna be down there covering uh, E3, and I think, you know, Microsoft's got a press conference as they do every year, and I think they're gonna show Natal again. They showed it last year, but I think we're getting close to Natal shipping. Yep. Um, I don't know if that's gonna be a big deal. Mm. I think it might have been a couple years. Yeah, ago. <laughs> Sony's gonna have a Wii like um, yeah. controller. Nintendo's had it for a couple of years. Right. Uh, so the difference is there's no controller. You go like this. And I don't know if anybody <laughs> really wants to do that, to be honest with you. I mean, wow. Leo, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> you, look like, you look like Elaine Dennis. Um, yeah, that's how, that's how Elaine dances. When you're playing in a game, you're going to look like Elaine dancing. That's a Seinfeld reference. Yes. Oh, man, you are old. <laughs> Actually, uh, our local Fox affiliate replayed the Seinfeld pilot last night and i called my wife said look it's jerry seinfeld in 1989 she wasn't interested all right so we're going to come back in just a little bit and i'll find something something about microsoft to talk about with you guys maybe um i don't know something in the corporate realm what do you you think about what you'd like to talk about ed i like your i'm a pc shirt i just noticed that I, you know <laughs> <laughs> i have one I'm wearing it. Mary Jo Foley's upside down. We still don't know why. Ed Bott is here. <laughs> We're going to talk more in just a bit. But first, a word from Drobo, the great Drobo hard drive. I don't want to call it enclosure. It's really a data robot that will keep all your stuff safe. You'll never run out of room. And now you can save $25 to $500 using the code WINDOWS at drobo.com slash windows. You've certainly heard about drobo by now if not let me tell you this thing is great the original drobo that's the one i've got at home four disk bays i've loaded it up with one terabyte drives but you know i could put two terabytes in that that means eight terabytes of data now some of that's reserved for redundancy about a, i think a quarter of it which means around six terabytes of storage and if if it, in fact the light just went off on mine that said oh this drive is too small it was a, a i think a terabyte or a it's 500 gigabyte drive. Just pop it out, put a new one in, and I've got more storage. If one of the drives dies, no data loss at all. It'll say the little lights on the front come on. You replace that bad drive. It rebuilds itself. You're good. You're good to go. That's just, I mean, it's just fantastic. Great for home users who want to back up data or uh, maybe have that iTunes library in a central location or movies or music. There's also the Drobo S that has five disk bays that not only gives you uh, more storage, but also uh, uh, more speed uh, for creative professionals, people who work with large data sets. The Drobo Pro for small businesses and creative teams, eight, count them, eight disk bays, up to 16 terabytes of storage. And uh, the new Drobo Elite, also with eight disk bays, but dual gigabit Ethernet ports. So you can use iSCSI to connect up to 16 computers. It looks like a local drive to as many as 16 computers. It's a storage area network at a much lower cost than what we paid for our SAN, let me tell you. I know because I'm crying. And the new Drobo FS, which is uh, runs dual processors, dual versions of Linux, has lots of applications for it. Drobo's really... They're really kicking it. They're just doing such a great job. I want you to check it out. Go to drobo.com slash windows to take a look at the entire Drobo line. And take a look also at the great discount packages on populated Drobos. Drobos with their hard drives. Savings from $75 to $500 when you use the offer code windows. D-R-O-B-O, drobo.com slash windows. We thank them so much for their support of Windows Weekly and all of our, uh, our Windows shows. Anything going on that we haven't covered yet, Mary Jo Foley, that you'd like to talk about? Oh, I potted you about down. It, but I'm, I'm surprised you didn't talk about what it. What was that? 
the market cap thing. Oh, I wasn't going to bring that up. I didn't yeah. want to rub salt in the wounds. You're upside down. I feel bad. <laughs> Actually, uh, Microsoft uh, passed again. It went back? It, it, it went yeah, back. It went today. back. Oh, that's funny. Okay, so I don't know how important market cap really is. It's just a, it's it's a number. Not. It's not. It doesn't mean how successful a company is, how big it is. It has nothing right. to do with anything. It's just how many shares of stock times their stock price. Um, right. uh, the the number one company in the world, Exxon Mobil. Number two yeah. and number three, neck and neck between Microsoft and Apple. And and number four is Walmart. So, I mean, this is, gives you an idea. These are big companies. And uh, Dell is somewhere down there, and I think that's really, from the point of view of Apple, that's really all they care about. It's like, because <laughs> Michael Dell said you should, they should sell off Apple for parts some years ago. Yeah, and, and, and give the proceeds back to the shareholders. Yeah, so. and I guess, well, Michael was wrong. I mean, let's face it. Uh, however, I don't know if it means a whole lot. Uh, yeah. Other than what, what I found funny about it yesterday was the emails I was getting about it, which were like trying to do a cause and effect thing with. Robbie Bach and Jay Allard leaving and Microsoft's market cap dropping below Apple. I'm like, um, no. I don't no. think so. No. <laughs> it has more to do with you being upside down than anything it else. It does. Yeah. It has everything to do with that. <laughs> it's just about as important. <laughs> um, so market cap, it's meaningless. It's a, it's, yeah. a, it's a number, it's bragging rights, but it, it doesn't change anything. Uh, it does show, I mean. I think I, it says, I, I, I think it says more, well, I mean, there, there's, it, it, it uh, puts a little punctuation on two long-standing narratives. Uh, number one is um, Apple has been uh, tremendously successful. Um, yes. You know, and, and they've continued to grow at the same pace that Microsoft grew in the uh, late 80s and early 1990s when they were an unregulated monopoly. Um, and uh, since... Ten years ago, when Microsoft was placed under court supervision and uh, forbidden from leveraging their Windows uh, monopoly into into other areas, their their growth has been basically flat. It's been a it's been a lost decade for anyone who owned uh, Microsoft stock during during that time. Whereas you know Apple stock prices up. You know, uh, roughly you know five hundred and fifty percent in a five lot. years or something. Yeah, a lot. Yeah, you know, it does. So, it doesn't mean that Microsoft that Apple is as big a company as Microsoft. No, Microsoft still has dominant uh, uh, dominant position in operating systems. Um, right. They're a, a much bigger company. They have a much broader range of products. They're in different businesses. In fact, in fact, that's important. You kind of pointed that out earlier. Let make that clear. Those four companies that you mentioned there are in four completely different businesses. Apple is a hardware company that that produces much of its own software to um, to make the hardware work well. Um, Microsoft is a software company that produces a limited amount of hardware that works well with its uh, you know with its software. Um, but it's you know but it, there's there's a uh, an enterprise software company more than anything else, and to a lesser extent a a consumer partner based company. And then you have a a uh, a a luxury consumer goods company would be how I would categorize Apple, and that's not an insult. No, that's, it's a good place to be. Yeah. A lot of margin that's, there. Tremendous, tremendous margins, so that they're able to. Uh, for you know, if, if you do the teardown on the products, uh, they're you know they're roughly equivalent to some products from Sony and Dell and such, and yet they can they can command um, quite a quite a premium for them, and they can also make a lot of money selling you know service contracts and and uh, services, um, and you know they their whole iTunes store. Has been, you know, a tremendous money maker. So sure. they're, you know, they're, but they're completely different business uh, from Microsoft. I mean, it would be like it would be like saying, you know, it would be like comparing Exxon and Walmart. Right. Um, you yeah. know. Right. I mean, I think I think it's telling when anybody ever used to ask Steve Ballmer, who's the biggest competitor of Microsoft out there? He, his answer was IBM. Yeah. And I think if you ask them that now, they wouldn't want to say IBM because they're trying to position themselves more as a consumer company. But if you look at where they earn their money. They're more of an IBM competitor than they are an Apple competitor. IBM is a consultancy right now, right? I mean, that's so what, is Microsoft that's, has a lot of consulting and works with partners. So similar kind of interesting dish there. Yeah. yeah. And well, and also, and and uh, we can you know use this as a segue to the other product, the other topic that I think that we might want to be talking about, which is um, Microsoft's cloud-based services. 
uh, for enterprises. Uh, their the, um, business, their B, BPOS, uh, their BPOS. business productivity online services, and their hosted, you know, hosted exchange, hosted SharePoint and stuff. They have been very, very successful with those um, with those products. And that is much more of an IBM style business, isn't it? A, oh, a, exactly right. I mean, that's yeah. why that's why um, IBM bought Lotus years right. ago was right. to get Lotus Notes and get the groupware and and email thing. And I guess that's why it. Microsoft hired Ray Ozzie. Yep. Does they Ray did, lead? Did, does Ray indeed. lead this group? Is this part of? Is this what Ray's been up to? Bpos. Um, well, it's it's one of the things that he's kind of uh, been fostering behind the scenes is, okay. is Bpos. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Exchange online. But I remember ship being on. on a, I, you know, I was on a plane. Coming back, oh man, this is you know this is like three plus three plus years ago. Sitting next to a guy from Microsoft who didn't you know he didn't know who I was, but you know we we were sort of talking about technology and and we wound up talking about email. And he says, "Oh yeah, well I'm working on this team. We're going to be doing some really interesting things with uh, with Exchange and and uh, and SharePoint coming up, and they're going to be launching you know in a couple months. Give me your card, and I'll I'll let you know." When they're when they're ready, and uh, that turned out, it, he was one of the key architects working on the original. Wow, uh, what oh, wow. what this turned out to be, and it's become a huge business. And who they're competing with? Their biggest competition right now is Google. Yep, with Just Google Gmail apps. And hosted apps, Google so, apps. Google wants to be in this space, but I think if you compare the two, uh, Google stuff looks so primitive compared to what Microsoft's doing in this space. Yep. Well, and again, I think um, you know we we can now go almost completely full circle. And if you come back to what enterprises, what businesses in general want, um, they you know they absolutely need. The number one thing is we don't want to be put out of business by the government coming in and saying that we didn't comply with HIPAA oh, or Sarbanes Oxley, Oxley right. standards. Right. We you know they and so they have just requirements in terms of privacy. Data integrity, um, data encryption, and security that just overwhelm everything else. And Microsoft has more experience than just about anybody on the planet. Does at, Google even do anything yeah. for that? I mean, uh, I I would certainly imagine they have a good story to tell there, and I wouldn't want to uh, give them short shrift based on on. Uh, but but my I have to tell you, of their products. if I'm trying to, uh, you know. Ma you know, f fulfill my socks requirements. I'm going to go somewhere like Microsoft or IBM. I would think yep. over over uh, a solution. Google just looks kind of down market compared to. This. I, I guess Google has had some um, some enterprise wins in there. They but. sure have, in a lot of cities and uh, some yeah. really a lot of universities. Universities, um, yeah, interesting yeah. But wins. When you, but when you ask them for enterprise customers, they seem to have like one or two that they always trot out. Right. So. And I'm yeah, sure Microsoft and, 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 has hundreds. And I just saw a press yeah. release yesterday, in fact, for, um, you know, I, I think BPOS just got uh, the University of Arizona to sign on with them for okay. uh, 18,000 seats. Um, and in the press release that, that I saw from Microsoft, the, the stated reasons were um, that, you know, precisely because of the privacy issues, which as a public university, um, they, they have no margin for error. On those mm -hmm. things, right. and right. doing doing research on government grants, they just have no margin for uh, for error on that. So that you know, they they made the decision on that. And I've had the uh, and what's interesting is that Microsoft sells some of those things themselves, but they also sell them through partners. So at the moment, I'm uh, evaluating uh, hosted exchange through a company called Intermedia, mm -hmm. uh, which very impressive uh, product. Uh, hosted service that they have reselling Microsoft's products. Interesting. And uh, and then my personal account is on is through yet another service that is uh, where the back end is through Microsoft, but it's resold through a through a reseller. So you know you've got a lot of you know if you if you don't want to go if you're not big enough to go directly through Microsoft, you can uh, go to one of their resellers and you still get the same platform and you still right. get the same uh, thing there. And one, one of the things I really love about it is, um, is uh, the idea of getting 
the uh, not only the the expense and hassle of management of these servers out of Oh, your God, you don't want to run an exchange server. You don't. Yourself. Well, you you really don't, unless you're a certain uh, 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 up and you know up until a few years ago, you, you were a certain size. You sort of had to, but now uh, the cost has gotten to the point where you can just um, you know completely outsource that, and it will run better than if you had it. And um, you know you can you can add user accounts, lower user accounts, and you don't have to worry about keeping track of things like client access licenses oh, gosh. Um, yeah. and you know that which that stuff is just a major uh, accounting headache for people who are supposed to be technical professionals um, so that's that's it and so we're going to I know Mary Jo and I are both going to be down at tech ed and I yep. think um, there's going a lot of that I, I've been I've actually been running it my own little SharePoint server in-house here and um, Boy, is it an impressive upgrade! <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny because we we use Google Docs very in a very ad hoc way here, but we I have an account with DNA Mail, which is hosted Exchange and SharePoint. I really should probably <laughs> pay more attention to it. But this is an example. Well, wait until they wait until they upgrade to uh, the, the 2010. Okay. Yeah. yeah to, to the 2010 releases because those aren't out yeah. there okay. yet. No. Uh, they're not intermediate intermediate you could talk to intermediate though they'd be delighted they're doing it to uh mm. to talk tell them i sent you I will. Uh, and uh <laughs> they uh they they're they're uh, very very good people and they have exchange 2010 running so you can uh, the outlook web access now runs in any browser um perfectly and it and it mimics outlook uh you know and, and it's just it's really an impressive uh, email client, uh, whereas Outlook Web Access with uh, Exchange 2007 was was very good or good enough in Internet Explorer, uh, terrible in any other browser. Right. right. Uh, you had these you had these uh, two different experiences, so they've completely completely fixed that. And then in terms of of, uh, of SharePoint, just uh, they've they've actually taken this collaborative file storage in environment and uh, put the office ribbon into it into a web page and again uh, it works with Safari on a Mac it works with Chrome it works with Mozilla um, Firefox and and with oh and by the way with IE uh, but it's it's no it, they're browser neutral to a, to a large extent don't require ActiveX don't require a bunch of funky stuff like that and um, We've been using uh, SharePoint um, as our primary collaboration mechanism for the last book that we've been writing on Office 2010, and it's just been a lifesaver. Um, you know, so easy to work with. Well, now I'm going to have to give it... This is an example of something... and I, I, We've been talking with Mary Jo about doing an enterprise show. This is an example of something that if you're not in the enterprise space, you have never even heard of. Uh, well, and it's also one of the problems with uh, all the people that we read online, all the bloggers and tech journalists. And we don't stuff, use this stuff. No, we all sit in our, you know, in our home offices or or in in an office that's run that's part of a media company somewhere. Right. Um, and and uh, and and our our organizations, you know, like I, I think CBS Interactive is still on XP. Um, really. That's yeah, depressing. So that's what I hear. <laughs> that's what I hear. But they're a big. But they're part of CBS. They're not going to make a know, big change wholesale. I understand. Yeah, they're not going to make a big change wholesale. So even though people look at ZDNet and they say, "Wow, you guys must be using all the newest toys," well, the individual bloggers are using whatever we want to in right. our offices because right. we're independent contractors. But the people who are working in the corporate offices are, you know, have to deal with the with the corporate infrastructure. So it takes a while for this stuff to percolate out there and it's also it's hard to find people who can write intelligently on this stuff and give real insights that are based on um field experience mm. you know that just they're they're all busy um you know they they they're you know they're 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 working for ibm or, right. or hp or HP, microsoft right, if they right. if they've got the skills to do that um they're you know they're, they're not, not sitting blogging, out, <laughs> blogging. They're, they're they're not Making you know, making big consulting bucks. Well, our, our new our new director of engineering here has just sent me a note saying, uh, "I uh, I've administered uh, these uh, before. We could do that if you want." So I don't know, but All maybe right. maybe this really begs for us to be doing more enterprise coverage. And I hope Mary Jo, yeah. uh, we can we can get that show off the ground because I think that's really yeah. something we ought to do. Yeah. I know it'd be interesting. Yeah. I think it could be good. 
Mary Joe Foley uh, covers. <laughs> I love this shot, by the way. <laughs> Mary, Mary Joe Foley has a unique perspective on the news. Uh, <laughs> she, she, she is the editor of the All About Microsoft blog at uh, ZDNet.com and uh, also, uh, of course, the author of Microsoft 2.0 from Wiley and Sons. You can find her at AllAboutMicrosoft.com. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Mary Joe. We love having you on the show. Really no, thank you very much. It. Ed Bott, Thanks. who is right side up today, uh, but just for today, uh, is also a uh, independent Windows expert and award-winning author and blogger at ZDNet.com. You can read Ed Bott's Microsoft report there and uh, follow him at EdBot.com. Thank you, Ed. It's great to have you on uh, once it's again. Been a, it's been a pleasure, Leo, and, and uh, happy anniversary, Paul, uh, wherever yes. you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> Falling his bottle bag or having a great time, I'm sure, in Lisbon right now as his steam comes out of his ears. What have you done to my show? He will be back next week. We'll have more Microsoft coverage. As always, on the Windows Weekly, we really appreciate you watching. We do the show live every Thursday afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, 1800 UTC, if you're in Lisbon, uh, so that you can uh, watch this at live.twit.tv, but it's also good to subscribe at twit.tv slash WW. You can get it on all your portable devices. You can even watch live on many portable devices now. Uh, thanks to the folks uh, at Ustream and uh, Mediafly. Well, we are out of time, but thank you for being here. We'll see you next time on Windows Weekly. I don't yeah. know anything about it. And I'll be honest, my eyes glaze over. I just can't, <laughs> I can't follow it. It's just not, you know, it's not in my uh, yep. wheelhouse. Not even nope, close. I think we're going to we're going to bring sexy back to enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do, you could more power to you. I'd say. And I won't even have to be upside down for that one. <laughs>